I welcome everyone to our training session, a teaching session, a session that is supposed to transform our lives, our understanding, as well as the ministry, the work in our hands. And I pray, Lord, that the Lord that will not take these sessions for granted, but it will do what it's supposed to do in every life in Jesus' name. In your life in particular, you will not come in vain, for the word will do its required work in every heart and life in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this hour. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for the training session we have now. Thank you for all our brothers and sisters, faithful people, always coming. And I pray none of us will come in vain in Jesus' name. And I pray that everyone that receives the word you need, a change will happen. A change for the better will grow up in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. Help us to grow in understanding as well as in faithfulness and fruitfulness in the work you have committed into our hands. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to Matthew chapter 5. And in Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 14. Matthew chapter 5. Reading from verse 14. Here are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And this is the manifesto of the kingdom. is being calling people to himself. And the disciples that came to him, they turned away from their sins, they repented of their sins, and they believed on him as the Savior, the Savior of the world, and in particular, their own Savior. And now he tells them what happens after you've had that change, after you've had that transformation, that you know that the power of the gospel has worked in your life. You become a child of God, a son, a daughter of God. You become a saint of God. What life are we supposed to live in our places of work? What lives are we supposed to live in our communities, in the family, with husband and wife? What kind of life are we supposed to live? And what is the response of a child of God in the world in which he lives? That's why he gives us this section in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. And then he says, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. He says, as we come to the Lord, we don't go to live in seclusion. We do not go to live as a hermit somewhere that will not come out and show the light of Christ. It says, we are now the light of the world. I'm sure you remember that Jesus Christ himself said, I am the light of the world. Christ is the light of the world in a world of spiritual darkness, in a world of spiritual death, Christ himself came for the light of life. In the world in which we live, a life, a, a, a world of ignorance and a world of superstition, the Lord Jesus Christ came for the light of revelation. Now he's come with revelation and knowledge from heaven. And as he comes with that revelation, he declares himself, and truly he is the light of revelation and the light of truth. As you think about the world in which we live, a world enslaved by the prince of darkness, a world enslaved by principalities and powers, then you understand as Jesus came with light vibration, the light of light vibration and the light of redemption, that's why he declares, I am the light of the world. And now we were in darkness. All sinners are in darkness. And the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We came short of the glory of God. You and I were in darkness, in the darkness of error, in the darkness of falsehood, in the darkness of evil, of deception, self-deception, in the darkness of captivity, were in the dungeon of the devil, so dark in that dungeon, in fact, in danger of eternal doom, eternal darkness, and eternal damnation. 
we came out of the darkness of the world and now we come into the marvelous light of the Lord Jesus Christ of his kingdom and of his glory and because we come into that light he leaves within us the light of the world and the light of knowledge and the light of truth and the light of redemption and the light of liberation and the light that show us the path to heaven that light lives in us and then we reflect the light of christ in our lives that's why looking at his own disciples as the people that have come into the light into the light of redemption and now we are saved and now we're totally delivered from darkness he said you are now the light of the world but then he says you're not going to hide behind a wall somewhere you're not going to hide in any community somewhere you're like a city that is set on a hill and everybody can see of course you understand if you're set on a hill and the hill is as dark as the valley and you are as dark as the valley nobody will see you because the valley is dark the hill is dark the mountain is dark and the person standing there is dark nobody will see anything but because now you are set on a hill and you have the light of the world living inside you that's why it says now you must reflect that light and it says in verse 15 neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel under a basket under a kind of covering under a bowl it says but on a candlestick again is saying we don't hide ourselves there's some people that say i'm born again i'm a child of god i'm the light of the world but i'm hiding somewhere and they're kind of closing the door against myself somewhere so that people will not see me jesus said that defeats the purpose of making you a candlestick it says you will give light unto all that are in the house as you come out as you shine forth and then he brings the conclusion and he says let your light shine not only that let your light so shine do you see a kind of a grad gradation there that you used to see a kind of moving forward there number one you are now light you're now light everything that covers that light remove all that and come to the open and come to the lamp light and come to the top of the hill and shine so that you can give light to everyone in your community everyone around you it says it's not enough even just to shine but let your light so shine isn't that similar to what we're told in john chapter 3 verse 16 for god loved the world uh -uh, goes beyond that for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life is putting that same word so in the very fact that now you are shining as light and it says let your light so shine and it says before me, I will not reveal and be Christian. Before me, I will not be fanatical and I will not tell people that this is who I am. Before me, I will not reflect the doctrine I believe. I hold that to myself. I'm going to make it private. She says, No, let it so shine before me. In fact, he goes on after saying, Before me, he says that they may see that they may see you see there are people the only verse they know in the new testament let not your right hand know what your left hand is doing keep it secret that your father who sees in secret will reward you openly that's the only verse they know in the bible but the, because of that they cannot take care of the sick because of that they cannot show love because of that they cannot reveal the identity of christ in them and the personality of a new creature in them but the lord is telling us there's a balance to this that's the other side of this you are not light of the world and in any part of the world you are let your light so shine before me that they those men may see your good works and honor and glorify and exalt your father 
which is in heaven. That's why he wants the lights to shine. That's why he's calling us that you uh, trim up that light. And if people are not seeing now, make them see. Make them see that a change has come in your life. That you're now a new creature. Talk about it. Witness uh, concerning Christ. And let them know salvation, redemption, forgiveness, eternal life is in Christ. Only in Christ. It tells us in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 14. It says, do all things. Do all things. Do. How many things, brothers and sisters? Tell me out aloud. Every time, everywhere, at home, in the office, in the church, everywhere. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. You see the people of the world because of the darkness in them. If they're going to do anything at all to benefit anybody, they are doing it grudgingly. They're doing it with murmuring. It's like somebody is pushing them to this. It's not, I, I shouldn't be here now. I shouldn't be doing this now. It's like a, this is over time for me. It's like, why am I here now? You have to push them you have to flatter them, you have to encourage them, you have to pull them up, you have to drag them before they will do it. And all the time, they're murmuring and complaining and grumbling. Why am I doing this? And it says, now that you are light, now that you are a child of God, everything you do, everywhere you are, you are excited about being a blessing to somebody else. You are excited about making your light so shine. You are excited to give what you have to other people. It says you do all things without murmurings and disputings. It says that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, as lights in the world. When you get to heaven, everywhere is bright. When you get to heaven, the angels are there. Christ is there. The Lamb is the light of the city thereof. And you will not be a special person shining there. If you're going to shine, this is your chance. This is your opportunity in the world in which we live that you allow your light to shine, that you'll be blameless, no fault, no sin, no blame, no compromise. And then it says, and harmless. You're peaceful, you're meek, you're loving, you're helpful, you're harmless. You don't hurt anyone as the sons of God. As the sons of God, children of God, that's what shows that you are in grace. That's what shows you have come into the kingdom at such a time like this. And when everybody is grumbling, complaining, criticizing and all that, you come forth and you shine as light. And then it says without rebuke. As, uh, as the, in, the, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, a crooked and perverse nation. You understand when you get to the office? A crooked and perverse nation. You understand in your profession? A crooked and perverse nation. You understand as you look at the behavior of people around, as you look at the character of people around, anywhere you are walking, anywhere you are living, a crooked and perverse nation. And now it says, don't be like them. And something in you that makes you totally different. Among whom ye shine as light in the world, holding forth the word of life. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ. That is the day when Christ will come back and then give us reward. For the people who have led to the Lord because you're shining, you're shining, you're shining. And Paul the apostle said to the Philippians, you are the work and the result of my evangelization, my commitment, my yieldedness to the Lord. And in that day when you are found as light, and then you become part of the stars of the crown. Of Paul the apostle, he says, I will rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain. What does that mean? If our converts are the same like the people of the world, we have labored in vain. If our converts are having the works of darkness, they're still occultic, 
they have not repented of their sins. They still hold on to their tradition. They hold on to their superstition. They hold on to sin and to evil. And they're still in darkness. It says that they were labored in vain. The reason they were laboring is so that once we who are servants of God we will shine as light. And then we reproduce saints in Christ. And those saints will shine for Christ. And then there are sons and daughters of the Lord. And they all shine. And so you go from the top to the bottom. From the highest to the lowest. From the ministers to the members. Everyone shining as light for Christ. And light in Christ. And I pray that that light will shine without any limitation in our church in Jesus name. And if we carry that light from the church, we go everywhere in our communities. And then people will see and people can tell that we are shining. Somebody there, you will shine. I said we will shine. Why are we shining? Because we are still in the world. What kind of world? The world is dark. And the world needs the light. The world needs the light. If you are a child of God, if you are a saint of God, the world needs you not to do like they're doing, not to act like they're acting. The world needs you to shine as light. The world needs the light, the light of Christ. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the spiritual stage of a crooked and perverse world. The world in which we live, crooked, perverse, and we need to declare, we need to detect, we need to determine the spiritual state of our crooked and perverse world. Point number two, the shining saints in a corrupt and polluted world. The world is corrupt. And you think about our nation, not only our nation, the whole world. There's corruption everywhere. People have corrupted their own lifestyle, their character. They have corrupted the whole system of the world. And in the corrupt and polluted world, we need shiny saints. Those who will come and make a difference in the world in which we live. The shiny saints in a corrupt and polluted world. Number three. The steadfast servants. Steadfast servants. If we only just shine and not show them how the light came into us, they might appreciate us. They might praise us. They might even testify, yes, we see light is shining. They might say, you have something that I don't have. But they will not know how to get that thing. But when you go from being a shining saint to a steadfast servant, that, that now you know that the reason why you are there is so that you will let them know how they too can turn from being a sinner to being a saint. Steadfast servants, saint to a condemned and perishing world. Steadfast servants, steadfast preachers, steadfast soul winners, steadfast pastors, steadfast people that reveal the mind of Christ and the way of Christ and the way of salvation to everyone around them. Steadfast servants, saints, to a condemned and perishing world. Number one. Number one, what's the spiritual state of this world in which we live? of the crooked and perverse world. We're coming back to that Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 15. Look at what it says about the world. It says that she may be blameless. Talking about children of God being blameless and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of what kind of nation? I said, what kind of nation? Tell me out aloud. Crooked and perverse nation. What does that mean to be crooked? It means they cannot follow the line that is measured by a ruler. When you have a ruler, you draw a line. The line is straight. But when the line 
cannot follow any rule, when the line does not follow any direction, when it is like this and like that, wobbling, turning, crooked, not straight, not straightforward, that's crooked, perverse, it's turned upside down. And the purpose for which God created that person, he cannot live in that purpose. His life is upside down. His ideas are upside down. His practices are upside down. And you cannot measure, you cannot put a ruler along the life in which he lives. Crooked. As you look at the world, that's the stage of the world. That's the situation of the world. And it didn't just start now. It's been like that for a long, long time. Deuteronomy chapter 32. I'm reading from verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And here we're looking at verse 5. And it tells us what kind of a world we're living in. It says they have corrupted themselves. Their sport is not the sport of his children. Their lives, their complexion, their attitude, their actions, their character. It's not like the character of the children of God that follows the rule. That you can measure, you can put a ruler by their lives. And everything is straight. He said, no, their life is not like that. Look at this. They are a perverse and crooked generation. A perverse and crooked generation. Among the young, crooked and perverse. Among those who are still learning and taking exams, you see the crookedness and you see the perversity of those the young people. And among the people who have left school, the same thing, perverse and crooked. And as you look at workers in offices, and as you look at, uh, you know, people anywhere, you can see everything is crooked. It's a crooked. Their lives are shady. Their lives are damnable. Their lives are defiled. Perverse and crooked. Psalm 73. I'm reading from verse 8. Psalm 73. The stage, spiritual stage, of the crooked and perverse world. In uh, Psalm 73, verse 8, they are corrupt. It's talking about the world. They are corrupt. And they speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. There's pride. There's arrogance. There's rebellion. There's disobedience, that's the world. And it goes on to say, they set their mouth against the heavens. They talk about everything, against everything that is holy, against everything that is righteous, against everything that is supernaturally godly. And it says, their tongue walketh through the earth. As you read in the papers, you see what people say. They talk about anybody, anyone, anywhere, anyhow. They don't have any honor appreciation for anybody. There's no respect for authority. No, not in the schools. No, not in politics. No respect for people that are higher than us. Not anywhere because the world is crooked. And because the world is perverse, therefore his people return hither and waters of a fool's cup, of a full cup, are wrong out to them. And they say, How does God know? They want to live their lives independent of God. That's the world, crooked. That's why they're crooked. Because He is the only one that can straighten out our lives. Christ Jesus, a redeemer. Christ Jesus, a savior. They will not allow him in their lives. They will not even turn from their sins and come to him. And they say, how does God know? And is their knowledge in the most high? Look at this. Behold, these are they. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper where? Where do they prosper? 
and yet look at their lives they know the crooked ways to do business they know the crooked ways to be fraudulent they know the crooked ways to get involved with internet fraud and they get rich and they increase in riches that, that's the world in which we live and this is the world in which now we live dark with evil dark with sin dark with occultism dark with rebellion against god and we're living in that world and the lord is calling us and he's saying let your light so shine in that crooked world in that evil world in that perverse world in that a world of evil it says go there don't turn them don't turn them and live a different life that is shining so that you will be blameless you'll be harmless you'll be without rebuke in this perverse and crooked world look at them in isaiah chapter 59 isaiah chapter 59 i'm reading here from verse 1 Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that he cannot save, neither is ear heavy, that it cannot, it cannot hear. It says, But your iniquities, that's what makes the world crooked, your iniquities are separated between you and your God. They're separated from God, separated from the Creator, separated from the Redeemer separated from the savior separated from the one who can straighten out their lives that's why they remain crooked that's the world in which you are living and if you backslide and join them your final end will be like their final end and it says your sins have hid the face from you that he will not hear not that you cannot hear he will not hear God does not hear those who are bent on doing evil. He does not answer their prayers. He does not regard them. He says, for your hands are defiled with blood. It starts with abortion. It starts with killing other people. And sometimes it's not just killing you know, with the gun or with the knife or with the machete. It's killing with the pen. It's killing with the mouth. Is killing other people and destroy other people by whatever means they can. They can do it. And it says, your fingers with iniquity, your leaves are spoken lies. That's why the world is crooked. The lies, the falsehood, the deception. It goes on to say, and your tongue have muttered perverseness. Crooked and perverse world. None call it for justice nor any pleaders for truth the trust in vanity useless things worthless things and it says uh, they speak uh, they speak um, lies and they conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity they hatch cockatrice eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs, eateth, will uh, die, dies. And that which is crushed, break, break it forth or out into a viper. Then he goes on about these people. And he talks about them in their crookedness it says in verse 12 for our transgressions are multiplied before thee and our sins testify against us for our transgressions are with us they have not been saved not forgiven not cleansed not separated from their sins and transgressions and as our iniquity is we know as for our iniquities, we know them. Say so those people must be very dark hearted, Old Testament people. They must be very much in spiritual darkness. Well, let's look at Romans chapter 3 and see what the New Testament says about the condition of the one who has not come to Christ. And about the condition of the majority of people in the land majority of people in the nation majority of people in the world it tells us in romans chapter 3 and reading here from verse 10 
as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one, crooked, perverse, corrupt, polluted, condemned, perishing, no one righteous. It says there is none that understands. There is none that seeketh after God. Maybe you think you're seeking after God. No, they're seeking after bread and butter. They're seeking after physical, material miracles. They're seeking after prosperity. They're seeking after money. And if there's no promise of money, if there's no promise of prosperity, those people will not be running to those places. If you don't uh, kind of uh, tantalize them, if you don't kind of uh, engage them in some fluffy uh, promises that God will do this, he will do this, he will do that, they will not go to those houses of worship. It's because they're hoping he'll give me this, he'll give me this, he'll give me this. They're not seeking God for who he is. They're seeking the gifts and the blessings he can give them. That's why he says, there is none that seeketh after God. The crooked in their perception of God. The crooked in their seeking after God. It says, they're all gone out of the way. All gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable unprofitable for the kingdom because God cannot choose in his kingdom to so crooked to so perverse and then he says there is none that doeth good no not one there's none that doeth good no not one uh, there are people who are looking to you know some people and then they say those people in their profession they're always crooked always crooked he's talking about the whole world Anyone who has not known Christ, anyone who has not given his life to Christ, is sinner, is crooked and perverse. A backslider is crooked and perverse. A church goer who is not born again is crooked and perverse. A preacher, a pastor, a priest who is not born again and righteous from within is crooked and perverse. No matter who you are, no matter where you are walking, if you have not known Christ, you are like them. You join them. You act like them. Whatever your profession and whatever your testimony, if there's no genuine salvation, you're crooked and you're perverse. And it says their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asps, a terrible snake, dangerous snake, poisonous snake, is under their leaves. And then he goes on to say, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their fear, it says, uh, their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways and it says and the way of peace are they not known then it goes on to say there is no fear of god before their eyes look at verse 19 now now we know that one thing so ever the law says it says to them that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and tell me what you see in your bible there Tell me out aloud. I can't hear you. That all the world may become, tell me, guilty before God. That's the world. That's the world. Perverse and crooked. That's the state of the world. Come to First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. We're reading from verse 19. First John chapter 5. Reading from verse 19. And we know that we are of God. If we're different from the world, we're of God. If we're born again, we're of God. If we're righteous by grace, we're of God. If we're living different from the people of the world, if we're straightforward, no more crooked. Those who are crooked are unpredictable. But if our lives can be predicted, if we're straight, if we're truthful, if we're righteous, 
then we have God. Look at the second part of that verse 19. And uh, somebody tell me there. Somebody read it aloud. How many parts of the world? I said how many parts of the world? The whole world, the young, the old, the boys, the girls, the sons, the daughters, the students, the workers, I mean office workers, the people in the market, the people in the community, anyone that is not born again, anyone that is not born again, whatever picture they show on the outside, and whatever kind of a pattern they might be following on the outside, whether they're religious or irreligious, and whatever they say out of their mouth, it says the whole world lies in wickedness. That's why the spiritual stage of the whole world is crooked and perverse. And now you were like that before. You were a sinner. You were lost. You were in darkness until you heard the gospel, the gospel that brought light to you. And then you decided, I see my darkness, I see my evil, I see all the corruption in my life, and you were not pretending I'm good, I'm like this, you know, my heart is plain and everything, I've never hurt anybody. If you keep on saying that, you remain in your sin, and you remain without the Savior, without redemption. But now that you understand, you are a sinner. Then you turned away from sin and you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And God picked you up and took you up out of that crooked and perverse world. He took you up out of that corrupt and polluted world. You came out of that world. You became totally different. That's how you became a believer. That's how you became a child of God. I'm looking at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, the crooked, the perverse, the corrupt, the polluted. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. It is when you repent as a sinner, God will receive you. There's nothing like, you know, I'm still a sinner. I hold on to my sin. I love my sin. I embrace my sin. I enjoy my sin. But Lord, I raise up my hand. Save me. You don't get saved that way. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. That's how it happens. And when you come to the Lord like that, saved, your sins are forgiven, then there's a change of life. You do not continue to live the same way you were living before. A change, a transformation takes place. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. If that has not happened to you, you're still part of the world. If you're still crooked, you're still part of the world. If you're still corrupt, you're still part of the world. If you're still perverse, you're still part of the world. It's what still polluted, polluted in your mind, polluted in your actions, polluted in your relationship, men and women, boys and girls. If you're still polluted in your mind, you're still of the world, a change has not taken place. When you are forgiven and you are set free, something happens in your life, in your character. John chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 11. John chapter 8, verse 11. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn you. Somebody there read the rest of that verse go and sin no more salvation does not give us license to keep on sinning salvation gives us the power to stop sinning salvation does not give us liberty to remain in the world like the world salvation gets us out and makes us to live a different life they are corrupt but you're clean they are perverse but you're purified, you're purged. It says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then speak Jesus again. 
unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He that followeth Christ will not keep on like the rest of the world in darkness. Is now a child of God. And as a child of God, there's a difference now in his life. I pray that everybody will see that difference in your life. Forgiven and set free. Look at uh, that same chapter. I'm reading from verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We'll be free. I said we'll be free. If you're a real child of God and you came out of that corrupt world, no more corruption, you're free from corruption. Amen? You're free from crookedness. You'll not be crooked anymore in Jesus' name. You're free from all the perverseness of the world, all the pollutions of the world. You say, no, I don't, want, I don't even like them. I don't desire them. I don't take any pleasure in them. Because it sets you free. Look at John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And I'm reading from verse 35. John chapter 12. We're reading from verse 35. It says in verse 35, Then Jesus said unto them, It says, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light. It says, walk in the light when you have the light, lest the darkness uh, will take over, and that darkness will come unto you, upon you. And then it goes on to say, if you are not in the light, and you slide back into darkness, that then you'll be walking in darkness, and you'll not know whither you go. Look at verse 36. It says, when you have the light, believe in the light. When you have the light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. Children of light. That's what he wants for our lives. He wants us to be in the light and to walk in the light so that we will not walk in any evil, any darkness at all. Verse 46, I am coming light unto the world. I'm coming light unto the world, into the world, and that whosoever believeth in me should not abide in darkness. Whosoever. You know, these are days that people will claim, I'm of this denomination. I'm of that denomination. And that's an excuse for them to remain crooked. Our church did not teach us that. A church did not emphasize that. A church said grace has covered it all. A church said, however you live, wherever you are, whatever you smoke, whatever you drink, and whatever bribes you take, and whatever lifestyle you follow, grace has covered everything. And so they are walking in darkness. But the Lord is saying, if you are a child of God, if your sins have been dealt with by Calvary, and if the grace of God has come into your life, you walk in the light as he is in the light. I pray you'll walk in the light. I will keep on walking in the light. Say it aloud for yourself. Looking at Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 1. Shining saints in a corrupt and polluted world. It says, Be ye therefore followers of God as their children. You see it? Be ye therefore followers of God as their children. You say you're different now and you're no more of the world. Then it says, Be ye therefore, therefore, because of that salvation. Therefore, because of that redemption. Therefore, because of that change and transformation in your life. Therefore, because of the testimony you are giving. That now I'm totally different. It says, be ye therefore followers of God as their children. And walk in love. Not hatred. 
and walk in love, not bitterness, and love, walk in love, not malice, and walk in love, not crookedness, the crookedness of the world, walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us and offering and a sacrifice to God for his so many savor. Look at verse 3. But fornication, that's the crookedness of the world, but fornication, that's the lifestyle of the world, but fornication and all uncleanness, anything related with the flesh, uh, fleshly sins. And it says, and or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as, tell me, become a saint. There's no sinning saint. There's no fornicating saint. There's no adulterous saint. There's no fraudulent saint. And there is no deceptive saint. A saint is a saint. A saint is righteous. A saint is redeemed. A saint has been cleansed from sin. And a saint is straightforward. A saint does business the way a child of God will do business. There's no covetous saint. A saint has become a saint. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking. Foolish talking. And there's some people that have a foolish talking. And what they say looks defiling. Their language is defiling. A man and a woman, they are together. And you may, maybe the man, you see some suggestive language and some defiling language that you kind of arouse evil in the heart of the woman. It may be the woman that is having some, you know, ulterior motive and is saying some things that will arouse immorality in the heart and the mind, in the emotion of the man. It says that's crookedness. That's part of the thing that it says they're perverse. Their language is not straightforward. Their language is not purifying. Their demeanor, their character, their conduct is not uplifting. It's something you have to go to uh, through the blood of Jesus. Even if you don't accept that thing, it brings something to your mind that shouldn't be in your mind when they talk, when they act, and the way they comport themselves, and maybe the way they use their body to touch your body deliberately so that you will think of evil. It says if you're a saint, you're not like that. If you're like that you are crooked and perverse if you're like that you are corrupt and you are polluted and it says neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient but rather the giving of thanks for this you know in verse 5 for this you know that no monger no unclean person with unclean language unclean attitude unclean conduct unclean movement that arouses uncleanness in the hearts of other people it says no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of christ and of god let no man deceive you and don't deceive yourself let no man deceive you with vain words for because of these things comes the wrath of God, the indignation of God, the judgment of God, and the anger of God upon the children of disobedience. Verse 7, verse 7, and we're going to read verse 7 together. Are you ready over there? 1, 2, 3, go, verse 7. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. They are corrupt. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. They are idolatrous. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. They are worldly. They are fleshly. Be not therefore partakers with them. They are polluted. Their mind is polluted. Their heart is corrupted. And you say you are a child of God. And you say you are a saint of God. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. You will not be like them. You will not say when in Babylon, do as the Babylonians do. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Whether you are in Babylon or you are in Rome, you are a child of God, you will be as Christ is. You live like Christ will live. You ask yourself, what will Christ do in this situation? And that's exactly what you will do. Give me a good amen. amen. 
Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. You are in Babylon. Do as a child of God should do. Live as a child of God should live. And be a shiny saint in a corrupt and polluted world. We're looking at Daniel chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 8. Daniel chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 8. In verse 8 it says, But Daniel purposed in his heart. You know, that's where it starts. You're going to the office. You know the condition of the office. You know the demands of the office. You know what they will tell you to do. Before you get to the office, you purpose in your heart. You're going to work under a boss. And you know how that boss is going to demand this, which is unholy, which is unrighteous, which is unchristianly. And you will make up your mind before you get to that boss. You know the temptation in the office. You know the temptation in your community. Before you encounter, uh, you, before you encounter that temptation, you make up your mind and your purpose in your heart. This is where, how I'm going to be. You're going to university. You're going to a college. And you know how the gangs are there. The calls are there. And all the crooked people are there. You make up your mind. I'm going to study. And I'm not going for this. I'm not going for that. You purpose in your heart. You want to be in the midst of some people that although they read the Bible and they have forgotten the standard of the Bible, they cut corners. They are fraudulent. They are liars. They are deceivers. They are backsliders. Although they talk Christianity, although they say they are this and they are that, they do not have the real conviction that what they read in the Bible is like that hundred percent that God will judge on righteousness. Before you get in their midst, if you have to be in their midst, if you have to walk there, you have to make up your mind, your purpose in your heart. I'm going to be a shiny saint. I'm going to be a different person. I'm going to be somebody upholding the word of God anywhere, everywhere I go. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the priest, the eunuchs, that he will not that he will not come what me, that he will not, scholarship may come, that he will not, they may say, remember you in Babylon, that he will not, remember, everybody is doing it, that he will not defile himself. I will not defile myself. I said I will not defile myself. I will not respect a Babylonian so much that I let go. The God, I will not respect a highly placed Nebuchadnezzar so much that I let go my conviction. I will not respect any friendly person so much that I say because of the respect I have for him, because of the respect I have for her, I will let down my standard. He said, I will not defile myself, you will not defile yourself. In this crooked world, you will not defile yourself. Let me hear deep and live headquarters. Amen. I'm looking at Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. And I'm reading here from verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Is it true? Do not ye serve my gods? And it says, uh, and worship the golden image which I have uh, set up Sh now. If ye be ready to change your mind, you will not change your mind. You are a saint, you will always be a saint. Shining, you will always be shining. What you hear in church, what you pray in church, what you committed your life to in church, when you get to the office, you will uphold it. The amen is too weak for me. Now, 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 in verse 15, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, then it goes on, Babylonian music, ye fall down and uh, worship well. But 
if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fairy furnace. Look up here. Nebuchadnezzar knew only of one kind of fire. Babylon knew only one kind of furnace. But you understand Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew about another fire, another furnace. That one is eternal. That one is on the other side. That one whosoever is not born again, whosoever is not righteous, whosoever remains crooked and perverse until death will get to that furnace. And because he only knew one furnace, the furnace of his making, he said, Anytime you hear that no, that music, if you fall down, that's okay. If you compromise, that's okay. If you forget church, that's okay. If you forget Bible, that's okay. If you forget standard, that's okay. If you forget the faith once delivered unto the saints, that will be all right. But if you say you're holding on, you will not compromise. You will suffer because there is a furnace of fire. You know, it's ignorant of the other, of the other furnace of fire. And I will cast you inside there. And then he said, if he does that, who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? It's at such a time. Because of pain. It's at such a time. Because of rejection. It's at such a time. Because of threatening. It's at such a time. Because... You're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your position. We're going to take that your wife away from you. If you don't worship idol, the idol of the family. It's at such a time when they are threatening, they'll say, okay, okay, I'm sorry. They're saying, I'm sorry to Nebuchadnezzar. I'm sorry to the devil. I'm sorry to the demons. I'm sorry to the crooked and perverse world. It's a certain time they bench, they bow. It's a certain time they compromise. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will not bow. You will not bow. You will not bench. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse 16, answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful. O Nebuchadnezzar, here we are, and we are not anxious, we are not fearful, we are not trembling, we are not timid, we are not afraid of you, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, we is able to deliver us. Our God, whom we serve, Thank God our God is mighty. Thank God our God will protect us. Thank God our God will preserve us. If there is no challenge, how do you know the power of God? If there is no test, how do you have a testimony? If there is no Nebuchadnezzar and his furnace, how do you know that the promise of Isaiah chapter 43, chapter 44 will be fulfilled on you? A God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning furry furnace and he will deliver us. And he will deliver me. And he will deliver me. And he will deliver me out of thy hand, O king. Well, you know the story. The man became angry. That's the problem with some people. They don't want their boss to be angry. They don't want the idol worshiper to be angry. They don't want uh, that fake friend to be angry. They don't want that uh, gang leader to be angry at them. They don't want anybody in their community to be angry at them. They don't want the politician to be angry at them. They don't want anybody anywhere to be angry, to be angry with them. They're so used to, well now, how are you there? How nice is everything? You know? They're so used to, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, ma, yes, madam. And they can never say no for their soul's sake. If you don't learn to say no to Nebuchadnezzar, and because of his very furnace, you will go to the other furnace, which is forever and ever. I've made up my mind, I will not go to hell. I will not go to hell for Nebuchadnezzar. 
I said I will not go to hell for Nebuchadnezzar. If you have to pass through that furnace, go ahead, go ahead. And go through that fire, it will not burn you. It will not destroy you. You will take your stand as a shining sage in a crooked and corrupt and perverse and polluted world. Eventually, you know the story, they went into that fire. And then Jesus came there, the fourth person, he came there, he was with them. He will be with you. Where are you? I said he will be with you. You will not comprehend. Look at verse 26. I'm reading verse 26 here. It says, then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning furry furnace and he spake and said Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, ye servants of the most high God, these are shining saints, uncompromising saints, come forth. And he came forth, they came hither and then it says Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego came out, came forth to out of the uh, furnace and then uh, he looked at them as he looked at them uh, he gave testimony later and he said therefore in verse 29 i make a decree therefore i make a decree that uh, in every every people nation language which speak anything against the god of shadrach meshach and abednego shall be caught in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunk hill why because there's the effect of shining because there's the effect of not compromising because this effect of saying no 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 to nebuchadnezzar and no to the compromiser and no to the one that wants to pull you into idol worship. There's the result because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. It brought a testimony. Your life will bring a testimony. It will make the people who have never seen, it will make them to see in Jesus' name. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. I'm reading here from verse 4. Daniel chapter 6, reading from verse 4. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom that they, and they, could, not, they could find no occasion, no fault. That's the Chinese saint. That's a sanctified saint. When they cannot find fault, if you are working you know, in the accounts department, in your place of work, they come to edit your work, they cannot find fault. If you're a teacher in a school, your relationship with the boys and the girls, they examine you, they cannot find fault. If you are supervising examination, and those uh, young people contribute money because they want uh, you know you not to supervise very well when a higher supervisor comes he cannot find fault with you if you're working you know, on anything and they come to examine that thing after you said you are finished they cannot find any fault that's a sage that's a child of god that wherever you are you're shining forth the light of the gospel and the light of faithfulness and he found no location of fault for as much as he was faithful neither was there any error or fault found in him and then they made an edict anybody who prays to god all these 30 days will be thrown into the lion's den. he knew that but he made up his mind, what is right, I will always do. Whatever the consequence, whatever the repercussion, whatever their edict, whatever is right, at home, in church, in Babylon, in Rome, in the office, whatever is right, that I will do. 
That's a shining saint. Not a person that is looking at the wind that blows. Not a person that is saying, if they come this way, I think I have to be intelligent and come that way. It's a person that goes a straight line. And you can put the ruler across the line in which he's walking. And so, when Daniel knew that that was the edict, look at verse 10. And then, now, when Daniel had known, when he knew that the, that, uh, the sea was signed, that is, the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open, at his, in his chamber, toward Jerusalem, he, what did he do? Kneeled upon his knees. You know, I cannot close my eyes at this time. There's insecurity. I cannot go to Bible study at this time. There's insecurity. I cannot preach at this time. There's insecurity. I cannot uh, kneel down at this time. Be bending down. I cannot do it the way I used to do it because, you know, it's dangerous. Not, not Daniel. Not Daniel. He made up his mind. You'll make up your mind. I'm talking to you. I said, you'll make up your mind. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day. Three times a day. Let me minimize my consecration. Minimize my commitment. Minimize the times I go to worship. Minimize the times I kneel down. Because now things are different now. And this year is not like last year. And this period, look at this period now. There's something going on there, something there, something there. I cannot be like before, not Daniel. Three times a day, he knelt down upon his knees and he prayed. And he gave thanks, he gave thanks, he gave thanks. He didn't question God, God, why did you allow this? God, why is this like this? Why is this like that? Why is this in this country where you have brought us now? Why are things? No question, no question. He gave thanks before his God as he did. Tell me. Tell me now. As he did at all time. And then the people who were watching, they saw what they wanted to see. And they cast him into the lion's den. But the lion could not bite that man. The lion of this world will not be able to bite you in Jesus' name. And the king came the following morning. Daniel, 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 are you still there? Or you are dead? Fanaticism has killed you. Religion has killed you. I will not compromise has killed you. Consecration has killed you. Verse 22. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me for as much as before him. Innocency was found in me. Also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. And that made that king to write an edict that anybody that says anything against the God of Daniel will be cast into this and that. He brought a testimony. Your life will bring a testimony. You are working in an office, they can hardly know that you are a Christian. They can hardly know that you are a saint. And you are moving somewhere in the community, they can hardly tell that you are a real child of God. They will tell from today. Daniel chapter 12, Daniel chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the firmament, as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. As the stars forever and ever. That's what the Lord is expecting of you, of me, of us. That will turn many to righteousness in Jesus' name. Shining saints, yes, sanctified servants, steadfast servants, saints to a condemned and perishing world. What do we do? Anywhere we go in our community. So what do we do? Point number three now. Steadfast servants, saints to a condemned and perishing world. We're looking at uh, Philippians. Philippians. I'm reading from chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And here we're reading from verse 16. Holding forth the watch of life. You're servant of the Lord. 
Anywhere you're walking, it sent you there to shine. It sent you there to show. It sent you there to tell of the gospel light so that you are holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain neither labored in vain we will not labor in vain I said we will not labor in vain he has sent us there because he knows there are perishing people there and he doesn't want anyone to perish. He has sent us so that we can declare the word of God unto the people and the people will not perish while you are preaching to them, witnessing unto them in Jesus' name. Look at Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3 and I'm reading from verse 9. The Lord is not slack. Concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, what? Is long suffering to us, anyone, everyone still in the world? Is long suffering, not willing that any shall perish, but that all shall come to repentance? Not willing, not willing that any shall perish, but that all shall come to repentance. That's why he has sent you. That's why he has sent me. That's why he has sent every one of us into the world to go and preach the gospel unto everyone and launch us. We're going to be faithful. We're going to do it. Look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 35. John chapter 5. Reading from verse 35. He was a burning and a shining light. That's John, John the Baptist. He was a burning and a shining light. That is, he was not called burning, lukewarm, burning, lethargic, burning, apathetic. No, he was burning. And you could see he was fiery and he was fervent. It says he was a burning and a shining light. And then while he was burning with zeal, he was also shining forth the word of the Lord. And it says he was willing for a season to rejoice in his light. What was the effect of John's life? As a shone and it was brilliant for the Lord, burning brightly. Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 15, For ye shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor drink, no compromise on that, no compromise on his lifestyle, and ye shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And, shall, and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. That's the purpose. That's the reason. Many of the children of Israel shall he turn unto the Lord. If that spirit will come upon you tonight, I pray it will come upon you tonight. That anywhere you go, you'll be a burning light and a shining light. And many will you turn to the Lord in Jesus' name. And it shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn, to turn, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's the goal. That's the goal. We're in a world, and you know the spiritual stage of the world, and we're here. As saints of God, as sons and daughters of God, as children of God, we're going forth anywhere we go now, anywhere we are, will be a burning and a shining light. We'll open our mouths and we'll declare the gospel to the people and turn many and turn many and turn many to the Lord in Jesus' name. This is a dangerous time. This is a difficult time, but it has such a time like this. We do the work of the Lord, and we will not relent, and we will not retreat, and we will not go back. We will do this work of the Lord victoriously, triumphantly, faithfully, fruitfully, unto the end, in Jesus' name. Did I hear an amen over there? 
2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 2. Preach the word. Be instant in season. Out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they give to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But, 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 why, why did he say but? He says, look at the condition, verses 3 and 4. You can see the corruption of the world there the perverseness of the world there. You can see the uh, crookedness of the world there. You can see the pollution of the world right there. And you can see their condemnation. And you can see that they are perishing. It says at such a time, when they say we don't want to hear, when they say we don't want to listen, at such a time, watch in all things. Endure affliction. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, endure affliction. Like Daniel, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist, the work of a soul winner. I will. Somebody there, I will. He says, Do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. You are consecrated, make the proof, show the proof of the consecration. You are surrendered to the Lord. Show the proof of that absolute surrender to the Lord. You are submissive to the will of God. Show the proof of that submission to the will of God. You are a worker. You are a servant. You are a soul winner. You are a preacher. You are a pastor. You are an evangelist. Show the proof and go into the world and remain faithful whatever may surround you. Make full proof of your ministry. I will do it. I said, I will do it. Rise up and tell the Lord, that's what I'll do. That's what I'll do. I'll be steadfast as a servant of God. I'll be shining as a saint of God. I will not be like the world. I will not act like the world. I will not uh, behave like the world. I'll not be lukewarm like the world. I will do what the Lord has sent me to do. And this work will prosper in our hands. This work will prosper in our hands. Shining saints, set for servants, promise the Lord we will do what you have called us to do. And let him give you more grace tonight, more strength tonight, more power tonight, and more commitment tonight to go ahead and to be different from the world and to do what the Lord has called you to do. Shine and speak for the glory of God.